All right. Well, I, I encourage you right now to take out your Bible if you don't have it out already. Get something to write with, something to write on. I'm going to talk to you this morning about, uh, I just called it, I couldn't come up with a good title. I just called this, Where is God in All of This? Okay? That is a question that is being asked all over the world and being answered in very different ways. And we want to answer it the best that we can from the scripture, from the nature of God that we see in Jesus Christ, and from his work and what he's done. We want to always base our understanding of who God is and what he's doing on what we see in Jesus. Jesus is the exact representation of the Father, the exact image. If you don't see it in Jesus, then you're not going to see it in the Father. You're not going to see it in his work. Jesus, people put it this way, Jesus is perfect theology. So we all need our theology corrected from time to time to line up with who God is. His nature is so, his, his word and his nature are, they perfectly agree and they never change. All right. So this question, every time there is any kind of a, an, an upheaval, a disaster of, of a sickness that goes through the world, you know, whenever this stuff happens, when there's a, a local tragedy, a personal tragedy, people rightfully ask, what's going on, God? And even those of us who feel like we, we really make a big deal of taking hold of his word and his promises and his nature, even for us, I mean, the question comes up in our hearts, Lord, you know, where are you in this? Who are you in this? Where am I supposed to be in this? What am I supposed to do in this? There are all these questions that come up. And it's not, that's fine. Two things I think we need to be aware of is that we don't have all the answers of why each individual thing happens in life. I don't think any of us can answer every situation that happens in life and why it happened that way. We don't have those answers. But what we do have is we have a foundation that we can stand on in the revelation that God's given us of who he is, what his will is, what his purpose is, how he functions, what his ways are. And again, that's established in his word and in what we see in Jesus Christ. We can never let our experience in life define who we think God is. We, de we decide who God is based on what God has revealed about himself. Okay, so it's really, really important that, that we understand we don't have all the answers, but we should never, I, I say this to you a lot, never let what we don't understand dislodge us from what we do understand. In fact, it's the only way we're going to get more understanding about why things happen on earth is by standing on what we do understand about God, what he has declared and defined about himself. That needs to be the foundation. All right, and as we stand there in confidence in God, then we can ask questions about, so Lord, okay, I know your will is for people to be healed. Your will is for people to have abundant life. So how do I, how do I relate to this? How do I define what's going on to my neighbors? Where do I? We can ask all those questions from a clean heart, not an accusing heart, not a frightened heart, none of that. It's just, we're just trying to learn more. Okay, God, how do you want to address this? What are you doing here? I, I want to be with you. I want to be in what you're doing. Does that make sense? So, so again, the first verse we go to is John chapter 10, verse 10. We always present this. Some of you, and I'll say this, some of you, those of you that have been at RMCM for a while or some other churches, you will have, this will be a good reminder for you, okay? We've been, we, we teach on this. We've heard this. But I can guarantee you today from past experience and from personal conversations uh, with people around town this week, today, this morning, right now, as we're talking about the nature of God and how he works, from pulpits, it is being taught 
that God sent this plague to teach us, to judge us, to train us, uh, that it's his will, it's his purpose, it's how he functions. And I'm going to tell you something different. And I'm going to establish it on the word. We're going to hit several really big topics, but we're just going to touch on them because that's all we have time for. All right. So we're not going to answer all your questions. We may raise some questions, but that's probably a good thing. But I, I just, I want you establishing these truths. So John chapter 10, verse 10, it says, this is Jesus speaking. All right. The thief comes only. This is the only reason he comes in order to steal, to kill, and to destroy I came, Jesus says, I came that they may have and enjoy life. And that word life is zoe. It's life as God has it. It's primary life. And he says that they may have, they may enjoy, have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. All right. So Jesus said, Jesus, this is, you can take, you can take a sheet of paper and you can draw a line right down the middle of it. And you can establish yourself that if it comes and it brings death and destruction, if it steals from your life, if it brings those things into your life, it is coming, it is not coming from God. And I'll give you a few reasons that things happen on planet Earth. But, but it's coming essentially from the devil. It is coming from the one who opposes God. If it brings life and abundant life, then it's coming from God. And those two do not cross that line. This is a foundational idea that we can never let go of. Jesus said it and he meant it. All right. Now go over to Luke chapter 13 with me. Luke chapter 13. Well, I've got to hurry today. I'm going to try and kind of stick to my notes if I can and read through some of these things because it'll go faster that way. Um, Luke chapter 13, we're going to begin in verse 1. All right, it says, there were present at that season some who told him, told Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered such things? All right, so what is that? That is a situation where a, a totalitarian government came in and murdered some people and then mixed their blood with the sacrifices that were being presented, the blood sacrifices that were presented to God. So, so this government came in and not only murdered people, but uh, defiled their ability to worship came strictly against their ability to worship as a show of force, set itself there as a show of force and said, we are more powerful than your God and you'd better be more afraid of us than we are your God, all right? And so people came and they said, well, what about this? They, their mind went immediately, just like a lot of people do this. Well, this had to have been judgment. God had to have been in this. Why did God do that? Why did God send them to kill these people and mix these. They came to Jesus with this question. And, and Jesus says, Deep, is this what you think? That they were worse sinners than everybody else. Good point that if God's going to be judging people around us, oh, something bad happened in their life. Well, that's God's judgment. Well, what about you? What about me? If he's judging their sin, if he's, if he's doing something like that for their sin today, what about my sin? Okay. But Jesus answered very simply. He says, I tell you, no. Was this, I love it. Was this the judgment of God? How did, why did God do this? No. Jesus just said, no. That's not what happened. Wipe that out of your head. All right. He says, but unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. He brings the point. He says, repentance is important. We need to turn to God. We need, to, we need to have God in our lives. Otherwise, we're going to perish. And, and that means perish eternally, okay? So he said, no, that didn't happen because of the judgment of God. But repentance would be a really good idea, okay? Then he goes on and, and he says, or those 18 on whom the tower at Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think they were worse sinners than all the other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? And again, he said, so what's that? Natural disaster. Natural disaster happens. 
people did what people always do. They say, oh, God, what were you trying to teach us? Jesus said, no. I tell you, no. That's not why it happened. That's not how it happened. But it would be a really good idea for you to repent so that you don't perish. Okay? And, and so he says it. So we have these two issues. And in both instances, people attributed what happened to the work of God in judgment. What people tend to say and what they're saying with this virus, this is a common Christian misunderstanding, misrepresentation. They, they, they tone it down, they water it down a little bit, and they say, well, but it might not be God's will that this thing is traveling through the planet, but he allowed it. And what that means, no mistake, what that means is God has a purpose in it. God's bringing it, he's allowing it. And so we've got to think about that. What that means theologically is that we believe everything that happens on planet Earth, God did it. God is in it. God has a purpose for it. It is a tool that he's using. Everything that happens, if we're, and if we're saying, because again, we're, it, is, it is not that passive a statement. We like to make it kind of passive. God, God allowed it. The reality is, what we mean is God allowed it, and here's his purpose in it, which means it's his tool, it's his will, it's his desire, it's what he is doing. I have been told this personally. God allowed this as a means of judgment. God allowed this as a means of training to grow the church. See, this stuff gets under my skin. I'm going to try to be nice. <laughs> Jesus said... Jesus said, you are cleansed by my word. We've talked about that a lot around here. By my word. Jesus never, ever made anyone sick or destroyed their business or anything like that to teach people. Never. Never. And Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. I've been told this is a divine moment, a divine move of God. I've been told this will, uh, it's Christ's will to bring people to repentance. It's been defined as a divine interruption and that we need to find and submit to the lesson that he's trying to teach us through it. And I'm here to say, no, no. It isn't how he works. So let's go on. So this whole God allowed it thing assumes that God is causing and controlling all the events on, on earth, which would have to include the choices that people make. So he is manipulating, he is orchestrating, and, and people, this is a tremendous misunderstanding of God's sovereignty. Make no mistake, God is totally sovereign. And in his sovereignty, he has chosen to put I don't know why, to put us in charge of the planet with, with him. We're supposed to be connected with him in doing it. But he has given us the authority here. Big subject. I don't, I don't have time to go into all. Let me just give you a couple verses. Genesis chapter 8, verses 21 and 22. This is right after the flood, right? And Noah comes out and he, brings a, he, he does a burnt offering and God smells the aroma of worship. And it's pleasing to him. But this is, get this, this is right after a worldwide judgment. Worldwide judgment because mankind was becoming so evil. And here's what God says. I will never again curse the ground because of the human race. Even though everything they think or imagine is bent toward evil from childhood, I will never again destroy all living things as long as the earth remains there will be planting and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. Meaning, I'm not going to intervene and bring worldwide judgment every time people do evil things. All right? He says he's not going to do it. Psalm 115 verse 16 says, The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to men. That word given in the Hebrew means assigned. It's assigned to us. All right, and again, it's way too big a subject for us to go into just today. We've taught on this many times. He gave us authority. When Jesus came back, he gave us authority in the garden. We gave it away in the garden. 
Jesus came back and took it back. And then he said, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Therefore, you go. We have a responsibility to pray. We have a responsibility to speak his word. We have a responsibility to lay hands on the sick, see them recover, uh, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, all of that, all right, to bring. Jesus told us to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, all right? That's our assignment. If God sent this, just use this as an example, this sickness into the earth. If it's God's tool, then we need, we better all get together and spread it as fast as we can. If this is what he's doing to teach us and grow us and train us and make us more holy, why are we trying to get people healed from it? Why do we have hospital workers trying to get people free from it? Nobody believes this, really. Not when it enters your house. You know good and well that God, if you know him at all, you know good and well. This is not God's nature. This is not God's will. And that's the important thing is to understand. I don't understand why all these things happen. This stuff happens. This kind of thing happens because there is a sin condition in the earth. There is a sin condition in the earth. But lots of things happen. Let me just finish this point. Lots of things happen every day on the earth. They happen. They are not God's will. Let me just give you a couple verses on that. First Timothy chapter 2, 3 and 4. It says, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. What's God's will? That all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Are all men saved and coming to the knowledge of the truth? No. Why? Because God is not forcing his will in the earth. It's, we, we need to understand, if we see something on this earth that's not what is seen in heaven, it's not God's will. If we see things on this earth that are not what Jesus did and what Jesus taught and how he lived and his, the nature of God that he displayed, then it's not God's will. And things do happen on this fallen earth that are not God's will. They happen every day. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not... I'm, I'm, I'm bridging this down, by the way. If anybody, don't panic, okay? I'm not rewriting the Bible. I'm just saving time. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, all right? Not willing that any should perish. We know that's not happening 100%. What does that mean? It means God's not forcing his will to occur on the earth, and lots of things that we see are not his will. They're not his will, okay? And the prayer is, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's our prayer. That's God's heart. That's our assignment is to carry that out into the earth. It wouldn't be fair to give us that assignment if he was going to confuse us by sending things all the time that are not his, his uh, or that were his will, that were, anyway, never mind. I lost my thought. I'm already on to the next one. Okay, so is it judgment? I don't want to take very much time on this, but a lot of people attribute these things to judgment. Here's the key. You have to separate the idea of judgment for personal sin. Every time, every time a hurricane hits, we, not we, but some believers, blame some certain group of sinners for it's God's judgment coming upon them. We see it all the time, okay? I heard this just this week from leaders, from church leaders. It's, if it, we got to separate these two ideas. Judgment for personal sin fell on Jesus. He became sin so that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. He carried the sin of all mankind, all mankind, okay? We have to appropriate that in our lives by making him Lord and putting faith in him for that. But he already carried. We live in a very unique age, okay? It is an age of grace, it is an age where the wrath of God is being held back. It is a because there is a day coming 
that where we will see the wrath of God on earth, and it isn't going to look like this. It is, isn't going to look like, oh, gee, I have to stay home and watch Netflix. It is not going to look like this. This is going to be a picnic compared to that. We won't be here, I don't believe. But anyway, you know, there is that day coming. But we live in this age of grace where there's the opportunity for anybody and everybody to receive him as Lord and, re- and come under that blood so that we have that forgiveness because he paid the penalty. So that's personal sin. But there still exists in the earth what we call a sin condition because of the fall of man. It's a sin condition. It produces, it produces negative things. Um, Romans, Romans chapter 5, verse 12, real simple. Sin entered the world through one man and death, which means, in, in this context, this is what death means, separation from the person, plan, and original intent of God. So it says, sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. Separation from the person, plan, and original intent of God. There is a condition in the earth. It's why things rust. It's why the Bible tells us over in Romans chapter 8, and I hope we get there today, uh, that the whole creation is waiting for the manifestation of the children of God. It's waiting. It's, it's, it's depicted as uh, just stretched out waiting to experience the freedom that we've experienced in Christ because it was subjected to decay. That's all because of the sin condition in the earth. So there's sickness, there's disease, there's poverty, there are all these things. They're not God's will. They're not God's purpose. And he's made a redemptive answer to them. And that's what the church is here for, is to carry that into the world. I hope this is I hope this is making sense to you, okay? We live in a really, really unique age. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, all right? So here's another one. What about the Old Testament? See, I'm just hitting these things fast. What about the Old Testament? We see plagues. We see the ground swallow people. We see uh, locusts. We see, you know, armies coming in and wiping people out. What about all that? All right. Let me just say this again briefly. The old covenant. We don't live in the old covenant, thank God. But the Old Testament, the old covenant highlights for us the severity of sin, particularly sin without the provision of grace. Okay, so there was immediate judgment in the Old Testament. Jesus took that so we don't have to. We live in a unique time. All right, the Old Testament highlights the severity of sin, the consequences and result of sin without the availability of grace, and man's complete inability to deal with sin apart from a Savior. That's the point of the Old Testament. And so, yes, there are things there, but we don't see that after the work of Christ on the cross. It was a different time. That changed through the cross. I had people this week reading Old Testament verses about judgment and trying to apply them to people today. It's a misuse of the scripture. It doesn't apply in that way anymore. It doesn't mean sin's not still bad and severe. And if you give yourself to sin, it will still produce death in your life. Absolutely. We see it all around us. Some of us see it in our own lives from time to time. We make bad choices and it will still produce those things in your life. But we've always got, we've got to understand God's not sending worldwide plague and not destroying groups of people because of their sin. Sin still produces death. The wages of sin is death. The Bible says that in the New Testament. If you give yourself to it, it's going to produce garbage, death, destruction in your life. No question about it. So stop it. Start living like a believer. Connect with God. Receive his forgiveness. And then start walking in the Lord. Okay? Um, So here's four reasons that things do happen. I really want to get over to. We're probably going to go a little long. But you know, you're sitting there in your jammies. So, oh, well. Uh, Why do things happen? Why do things happen on planet Earth? Well, there's at least four, okay? We talk about this a lot. God's will is one of them. And mostly that's seen as people 
line themselves up, you know, with him and live according to him and see, see his blessing and favor flow through their lives. And we get testimonies of that all the time. But God's will certainly impacts things on the earth. But Satan also has a will. There is still a thief that wants to steal, kill, and destroy from, from your life. So sometimes things are demonic. Sometimes things are really coming from the demonic spiritual realm. It's real. Jesus dealt with it. So there's that influence. Thirdly, there's human choice. And I, personally, I think it's the biggest thing going on this earth. Just not because it has to be. Now, I'm not, you know, demeaning God. I'm just saying this is the way he set it up. This is, he's given us authority. He's assigned the earth to us. We make good and bad choices, and they always affect other people. You know, we've talked forever about how much is your sin going to cost me? How much is your sin going to cost your family? How much is your sin going to cost you? You know, when we make those choices and we reject God, Bad things happen, absolutely, and a lot of things that happen. It's not God's will. It's not God's judgment. It's not God trying to teach anybody anything. It's a bad choice, and it affects a lot of people. So there's human choice, and then there's natural law. We've talked about this a lot. If you insist on driving down Monarch way too fast on slippery roads, and you go off the edge, and gravity pulls you into the rocks, that's not God's fault. That's not God's will. He's not trying to teach you something. It's gravity. Gravity works like that, okay? So, so there, there's natural law. There are things that happen, all right? And all of those things influence things on earth. So we've got to be really careful about trying to attribute all these things to God. And I'm telling you all this today, not just for you, but for your friends, for your neighbors, for people that are going to be really confused. These questions always come up, and honestly, it's an opportunity to bring the truth to people. All right, Romans chapter 8, sacred cow time. All right, I'm going to take probably about 10 minutes here and do this. I'm going to go through it really quick. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, in my opinion, is one of the most misunderstood misused. It's a wonderful scripture. It's a wonderful scripture, but I believe it's misused. It's misunderstood. It's misrepresented constantly. All right. So for a lot of you, this is going to be a sacred cow scripture and I'm going to make you mad. So listen to what I'm saying and then you take it to the Lord and you consider it. All right. So Romans chapter eight, verse 28. We all love this verse. It's a fantastic verse. And from the King James, it, it reads, uh, or anyway, something like, we know, I think this is the King James, we know that all things work together for good to those that love God and that are called according to his purpose, right? We know that all things work together for good. So this is a verse that a lot of people use to say, you know, bad things come into life. And rather than discerning, God, how do you want me to deal with this? Do you want me to aggressively deal with it in prayer? Do you, do you have a way around it for me? Do you have a way through it for me? Do you want me to beat it into the ground with the name of Jesus so that everybody gets free from it? Well, how do you want me to handle this? Instead of that, we just say, well, all things work together. I always see the hands thrown up with these. Well, all things work together for good. So I'll just wait it out and God will somehow make this work for good, right? That is a common, common interpretation of this verse. From that, we get uh, such popular sayings as, God is in control. God is in control. And I know you're trying to honor God with that. And what I'm about to say is going to step on your toes. God is not in control. God is in authority. Listen, God is in authority. Absolutely. But God, in his sovereignty, has chosen to assign the earth to man, to send a Savior, but then let us connect with that Savior and send us, the church, into the earth with his assignment to do the works that he did and greater works than he did. God is, he is just not. There's, the Bible does not support the idea that God's controlling every single thing and therefore, we just throw up our hands and we just have this passive Christianity. That's not who the church is. That's not the assignment that Jesus gave us. So, so people take those things. God, you know, God is in control. Um, 
and those types of things come from this. And we need to understand that um, most Christians read that verse to say that God in his sovereignty causes or allows everything that happens. He makes everything happen. No matter how devastating or destructive, he will mysteriously produce something good from it. All right? Now just stick with me. Listen to me, okay? Again, if this is true, we should immediately stop praying for the sick, stop helping the poor, stop doing all that, because if that's God's will for people, we have no business interfering in it, okay? There'd be no need for strong prayer, for intercession, for obeying the assignment that we were given to heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out demons. There'd be no need for any of that if that's all God's will and sent. It is an extreme view of God's sovereignty. It was not demonstrated by Jesus. So let me, let me say this. So what is it about? All right. Romans chapter 8, the entire chapter, beginning to end, is about God and the Holy Spirit in particular partnering with believers to undo things both inward and outward that are not God's purpose and will for our life. And I'm going to give you a series of examples of that. The whole chapter is about God working in and through believers to address circumstances. Some of them are inward, but attitudes, okay? But he's working, partnering with, are you getting it? With believers to address circumstances, all right? I hope you got that. I can't look at your faces. I hope you got that. All right? So, let me just give you these. Verses 5 through 7, Romans chapter 8, shows God working with believers to renew their minds, transform carnal thinking, godless thinking, and believing to thinking and believing that agree with the mind of Christ and that represent the mind of Christ. Verses 5 through 7. God partnering with believers to change the way we think. Bring us from carnal thinking to godly thinking. All right? Which, of course, changes our whole life. Verse 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 8. Shows God giving us guidance that causes our lives to be pleasing to God. God partnering with the believer to guide us and to lead us so that our lives become pleasing to God. Verse 11, all right, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that lives in us, releases the same resurrection life that raised Jesus from the dead. He releases that life into our mortal bodies. That's a big healing scripture, Romans 8, 11, all right? But there he is partnering with us, releasing life in us. All right, verses 12 and 13. He empowers us to overcome the power and pressures of the flesh and make godly choices. He partners with us. The Holy Spirit in us empowers us to overcome the power and pressures of the flesh and make godly choices. Verses 14 through 17 impress us with the fact that we are God's children and we are partners, participants in his activities. And it empowers us, those verses empower us to take that role as God's children. That, that verse there that says that we are the children of God, it is that Greek word huios. It is adult children that partner in the Father's business. They are partners with him. We are doing the works of Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit. So we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to know who we are, to live out of who we are, and to address what's going on in the earth from who we are in the power of God. All right, that's partnership. That's partnership. Verses 18 through 25. The Spirit is partnering with and working through the children of God, same word, we us, adult children, to release resurrection life and freedom from the power and consequences of sin that we have experienced and to release all of that into the creation. He's empowering us to release into the creation the same liberty from the power and consequences of sin that we've received. Those are the verses I was talking about earlier where it says the whole creation is it's depicted as 
eagerly waiting for us, for the children of God to be manifested. That means to come forth, to display what's on the inside of us, for the Spirit of God to be able to work through us, to bring liberty to creation itself. And it says it was subjected. I already told you this, but it says that the whole creation was subjected to the weight of sin, not by its own choice, but because man sinned in the earth. This is why your vehicles rust when you said, I'm serious. It is a, it is a condition of decay. And, and obviously our ministry is not about fighting rust. But the idea is there's this decay. Sin decays. Relationships decay. Our bodies decay. God in us and in believers is working against that. All right, so he's in us working against what's on the outside of us, all right? In every one of these, we know instinctively that people dying from disease and natural disaster and plague and poverty and broken lives, it's all wrong. It's not God's heart. We know it. Creation knows it. These are probably, read this chapter. Read it maybe with a new idea. Verse 26, oh, so good. The Spirit is seen partnering with believers to give them the ability to pray the most effective prayer at the right moment into a situation that they don't even understand. He gave us a powerful prayer language that goes beyond our understanding and our misunderstanding and our lack of understanding and prays the spirit in us, prays the heart and will of God out into the earth through uh, the, the personal prayer language that he gives us through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's powerful. Again, it's, it's the spirit in us releasing the life of God into what's on the outside. Okay, you get to verses, we're going to skip verse 28. You get to verses 29 through 39. We are told that we are more than conquerors, that nothing in the natural or spiritual realm can overcome us because God is with us, that we are called, we are justified, we are equipped, we are glorified, and that if God gave us his son, how could he possibly not provide us with all things? You guys know that section. It's awesome. But... So in the middle of all that, we have had the habit of taking verse 28 and suddenly we're supposed to take it and see God as partnering with the circumstances to work toward believers. It's totally out of context to see it that way, to see all things work together for good instead of realizing in all of these verses, I'm going to tell you why, don't shut me off. I know you can just flip the switch. Uh, in all of these other verses, let alone the rest of the New Testament, the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, we see God in us addressing circumstances. But suddenly we want to lift this one out and say, well, I can just sit here and all the circumstances are going to just produce something for good. So what's the deal? What's the deal? All right, here's the deal. In the original language, in Greek, and you can find this in any good Greek study on this verse, and there are translations that bring it out just the way I'm going to say it to you. All right, in the original language in verse 28, there is no way to tell whether all things are working Okay, all things are working, or that God is working with us and for our good in the middle of all things. There's no way to tell in the sentence structure whether all things are working or whether God is working in the midst of all things. But God working in the midst of all things lines up perfectly with the whole rest of this chapter and the rest of the New Testament the work of Jesus, all of that. God working in and through believers to bring about good in the midst of all things, all circumstances, all events on earth is consistent with the whole context of chapter eight as well as the rest of the Bible, okay? In other words, oh, sorry, I, I don't want to go there. That'll get me off track. Okay, so what God is seen doing there link it back a few verses, he is seen partnering with us in our labor, meaning birth pangs, to bring forth life in the midst 
of all circumstances, all the things that are going on on the earth. I hope this is getting through. Is this making sense? Some of you who are in the room. All right, let me um, go. I need to go over there and read this to you. The NIV, just for one, there are others. The Amplified has footnotes that say this same thing. But the NIV reads this way. We know that in all things, in the midst of all things, is what that means, God works for the good of those who love him. Okay, not through all the circumstances, not through the disease, not through the virus, but in the midst of it, God is there partnering with his people, just like in the rest of the chapter, to bring about his will, his life, to, to eradicate things like disease, to, to help people. I mean, this goes to every level. I just have to trust that you're getting what we're saying here. So here, here's what the Lord, we've got to quit. Here's what the Lord showed me or the examples that he gave me. Okay, again, so we're not just going to throw up our hands and say, well, this happened. God works all things together for good or, or well, God's in control. So I guess it must have been his plan and purpose for this to happen in my life. Here's what the Lord spoke to me when we were doing this. God was not in the car accident happening he was in the car with you when the accident happened. Get that? He was not in because that's the way people, I know some people say, oh, you're splitting hairs. Maybe, but it's a pretty important hair. Okay, it totally goes to the nature of God and how he functions in the earth. All right, he wasn't in the car accident happening. He was in the car with you when it happened. God did not take your spouse or your child to teach you something. He is with you as you walk through that horrible level of grief that was never his will or plan or purpose on the earth. It's not happening in heaven. It's not his purpose on the earth. Okay. God's not in this virus. God is in believers calling and empowering them to lay hands on the sick and see them recover, to be a source of encouragement peace, supply of material things, all of those things. God's promises are not in quarantine this morning. God's promises are relevant. They are alive. They are here. And we need to understand that we are called to partner with him and to out of what he pours into us and gives us materially every, every possible way. We are to address the circumstances that we are in and others are in. Anytime you allow your circumstances to define who God is and what he's doing, you're going to get off track. It's not how he does it. He has defined who we are. So listen, I know that I'm, I'm talking to 90% of the people here about this verse. I know it's your pet verse. I know that just it's a wonderful verse. It's an awesome verse. Just understand what it really says so that you stay in purpose. You stay flowing in your connection with God and pouring it out, not just taking on a passive Christianity that stands back and says, well, this must be God's will. Lord, what are you trying to teach me? Are you judging people? Are you trying to teach me? Are you trying to grow me? Now, I'm trying to quit, I promise. We do grow let me say it this way, we can grow in the midst of horrible circumstances. If we stay connected to God and listen to him, we can also be destroyed by circumstances. We can move into self-reliance through circumstances. We can move into sin in the midst of circumstances. It isn't the circumstances that train you. It's God who trains you through his word. It isn't the circumstances that grow up the church. It's the, it is the word of God spoken by the spirit of God who may in the, he'll use these situations. And I know that's what a lot of you are saying is, well, in the midst of all this, I can grow. Yeah, you sure can. But you can also grow, get this. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to quit with this. You can also grow before the disease comes. You can also grow before the stock market falls. You can also grow by walking with God ahead of that so that you, when we come into this, are ready and equipped to start just seeing opportunities to release what's already in you, okay? The idea that the only way God grows us is through adversity, and I heard that this week too, 
Adversity is the normal way that God trains us. That's not what, all I can say is that's not what Jesus said. I could say a lot more than that, but it would get ungodly. That's not what Jesus said. That's not what Jesus demonstrated. That's not how he taught his disciples. So grab hold of the word, grab hold of what we're saying. If you're wrestling with it, fine. I can talk to you about it more if you want. Just take it to God. Just take it to God, do some study, and uh, I'll quit. Thank you, Lord. Father, let's pray together. Father, I just thank you this morning. Lord, I pray, Father, that this would clarify in some people's hearts today who you are, what you are doing, what we are facing, and Father, your role in the midst of all this craziness that's going on that you would define again for us as your church, who we are. We need to hear it again. What you have equipped us with and who you, have, you send us out every single day to be in the middle of this situation. Father, we can come into this situation completely secure in you, knowing not that just everything's going to work out somehow, but that you have a role and a purpose for us and you are equipping us. You have already equipped us, and you are equipping us right now, Lord, for your purposes for our individual lives. And Father, we say it every week around here when we're closing up. We say Jesus is Lord over the Gunness and Basin in the world and go out there and be the church. We stand ready to be sent into these situations this week to take the gifts, the equipment that you have given us and to be the church and to release your life on this earth. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's say it on the count of three. Jesus is Lord over the Gunnison Basin and the world. Oh, I'm supposed to count. Yeah. One, two, three. Jesus is Lord over the Gunnison Basin and the world. Go out there and be the church. Amen.